Greetings class, welcome to another session here of Second Language Acquisition. Today we're going to be talking about the ever popular concept of communicative competence. We'll be defining what it is, we'll talk a little bit about uh, language functions, and we'll talk about the different types of competencies that are involved in uh, communicative competence. We'll also take a quick look at nonverbal communication and then communicative language teaching and also task-based language teaching. That's what we're going to try to cover in the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Let's move on here to talk about communicative competence and what exactly does that mean. Uh, we all know what communication is, but this is now the understanding um, of language and communication beyond, beyond just the linguistics of it. Right? Uh, the phrase was first coined by Del Himes. Communicative competence enables people to convey, interpret messages, and to negotiate meaning between others within a specific context. Okay, so these are the skills and understandings to interpret messages, convey meanings. Cummins then later defines communicative competence in these two areas. Basic interpersonal communication skills, and these are just your basic skills for communicating, right? Um, and to let you know, this is not specifically limited to language, to linguistics and language. I have met many people who do not do well on a TOEFL test, but do very well in communicating. Well, they're different. Uh, and that's what the BIX is all about, BIX, Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills. The other element that's involved here that Cummins defines is cognitive academic language proficiency because there are so many people who are trying to learn a second language to enter university or get some type of schooling. Uh, we separate these two elements out. One is a is larger. Your BICs are larger because it encompasses so many other environments. And CALP is more limited to the academic environment. But they are elements that students can understand and that's part of this whole idea of communicative competence. In fact, there are ele other elements. There are grammatic, there's grammatical competence and that's lower level, more specific, more detailed types of things. Discourse competence is the ability to understand the conversations and the interactions and the specific uh, words that are deliberately used in a conversation. There are sociolinguistic competence, understanding the sociolinguistic components that are going on uh, within communities, within people, so it's a larger type of thing. And then there's strategic competence uh, or pragmatic competence, and that's to understanding what's going on that's not being said, the, uh, the un undisclosed types of things. Um, uh, this is a copy from uh, uh, an example. I'm not a copy. This is a, a drawing that's based off of Brown's uh, textbook here regarding second language acquisition, principles of language learning and teaching. Uh, and here he tries to show you the different levels and different types of competencies that are going on here in this communicative competence uh, scale. The ones that we're probably more used to are on this side. Uh, if you've studied linguistics, if you've studied language, you cover things like grammar and vocabulary and maybe morphology and, and phonology. Maybe if you're teaching or learning about writing, you've learned about rhetorical or cohesion. All of those competencies that are necessary in a variety of ways for communicating. But then we have the pragmatic, and these are different elements that are still involved in communicating. You have your illocutionary competence. I intend to say something, and what's the intended meaning, not necessarily the actual meaning. ID, ideational uh, functions, ways to, to speak in the in the more theoretical and the functions that involve their manipulative and how you can use language to manipulate imaginative functions the ability to dream and theorize sociolinguistic competencies and that's uh, again dealing with uh, how, how to deal with uh, people in different uh, social linguistic sociocultural um, backgrounds, a sensitivity, for example, to dialects, a sensitivity to res, uh, to register, if you know what register uh, is, you know, speaking to somebody that's at a higher register of language, or they're more formal and more polite, as a lower register is less formal, less polite. You speaking to your buddies on a Friday night while you're eating pizza and watching a movie is going to be very different than when you're speaking to um, a congressman or when you're speaking to a police officer at right, a different level. 
uh, your naturalness sensitivity. How is the proper way of speaking? And then you have the uh, cultural uh, sensitivity to understanding um, the way uh, different cultures speak and uh, different things like figures of speech and what those things actually mean. There are different, many different components to communicative competence. As we see here, we've got, ooh, um, four, we've got about, uh, over a dozen here that are listed here. All of these are all connected somehow into this whole idea of communicative competence. Um, now, as we look at how we communicate and this whole communication thing that's going on, one of the areas that uh, linguists and language specialists look into are the functions of language. And why do we use language? You know, what are the reasons that we do whatever? And there are a whole bunch of reasons. And I should stress that none of these that are on this list right here, none of them are discrete and none of them are mutually exclusive. These are ideas that linguists have thought of with regard to why we use language, why we employ language, right? What are the functions that we're doing? And they created a list. There's probably more that goes on here. As I look through this list, I don't, I, I think of uh, the, just the idea of collecting information uh, for later analysis, and that's not on this list. So there are other things. There's instrumental functions to cause a specific thing to happen. I'm using language as an instrument to do something. You know, ready, set, go. I'm using it to do something. Regulatory functions used to control or limit uh, how language or something is being done, right? Representational, to represent reality. Uh, we can use language to do that. We can use it for interactional functions, for uh, social convention. Uh, the example here is phatic communication, which is basically talking about unimportant or small talk or um, um, a very non-personal type of uh, communication. You've got personal functions to share your personal feelings or your gut reactions. You've got heuristic functions to uh, talk about how you can acquire knowledge skills or maybe asking the, the what ifs or the but why type of questions. Again, you have imaginative functions to theorize, to dream. Okay, and there again, there are more to these. I know that Brown lists uh, a number of them, but there are more of them that... Uh, we could certainly talk about. There are a lot of reasons, there are a lot of functions that we can look at, uh, that we can describe when we're talking about language use. And so as we're looking at these language functions, one in particular is something called a speech act. And a speech act is a communicative behavior intended to accomplish a particular purpose. I say something and I'm doing it to do to perform a specific purpose. Uh, maybe I am intending to inform you or I'm intending to uh, stop you. Maybe I'm intending to threaten you uh, or encourage you. Those would all be considered speech acts. Um, two subcomponents of a speech act would be a prolocutionary perlocutionary and illocutionary. Illocutionary speech act is is the is my ability to send a message to you, right? And it has a specific meaning or an intended meaning. And uh, we may you may not know what that meaning is. Now, you being able to receive that is called a perlocutionary act, okay? It produces an effect whether it was intended or not, right? Is it received by the addressee, okay, by a speaker's utterance. In other words, I, as the speaker, create illocutionary acts, and you, as the listener, create perlocutionary acts. Okay? So, the, again, these are functions that are involved in language. People who go down this uh, trail of discourse analysis can look at these and talk about a whole bunch of different theories and possibilities. And you know, we, here we can get into the subject of lying, which I am hoping we will get to eventually, uh, where uh, someone intends to or doesn't intend to lie, or insulting. Uh, you know, one says something as an illocution, or they intended a particular meaning, but the other, the uh, listener may not have heard the insult, or they may have heard an insult where one was not intended. So the perlocutionary act was different from, from the illocutionary. Obviously, it's best if both of them are the same, but they don't always happen to be that way. Um, so there are a lot of functions in language. 
This whole idea of functions in language encouraged some language educators to develop a functional approach to language teaching. So we all communicate and we all have these communicative abilities, this understanding about how language works. Uh, and so someone started thinking, you know, let's not teach language via the old fashioned uh, traditional grammar translation or via, um, uh, uh, you know, the audio lingual method. Let's let's just do it the way we use language. Let's teach functions. And uh, so they created this uh, approach to language teaching called the functional notional approach. And you taught functions, you know, you taught people how to. Uh, request for information, ask for directions, uh, politely refuse, uh, how to properly uh, excuse yourself when you're at a party, or uh, how to apologize. They create all these functions, and they put them in order of uh, difficulty, uh, or order of importance, which ones are used more frequently. So oftentimes when you, when you look at a language book and they're teaching someone language, they might begin by saying uh, greetings, and they'll go through the function of greetings, and they'll go through that process, and yeah, that's a function. And they may also be talking about notions, and these are more abstract concepts, things like time or space or uh, quality, that type of thing. And so they'll try to encourage those. So they shy away from the more traditional vocab and grammar uh, push of those databases, and they move more into, into these functions. Um, when I teach, uh, I also use these. I use these functions because there are times where it's very good and necessary. In particular, when students are not actually looking for academic competence, but um, they're going to Hawaii uh, for uh, three weeks and they want to be able to go into the restaurant, they want to be able to go into the, the, uh, the hotel, they want to be able to order something. They, want, they just want to do those types of functions. So you can stress those and get them to learn those uh, patterns, obviously the vocab and grammar that go with it, and they can learn those functions. So it's a very interesting a way of learning, um, learning language. It can't get you up to the upper levels, but it certainly can get you fairly well in the lower levels. Uh, beyond this, I want to talk a little bit more about discourse analysis. There are people who analyze discourse, uh, and their reason for doing this is to find out how language is being used. So uh, discourse analysis is the examination of the relationship between the forms and functions of language beyond the sentence, both in spoken and written form. So rather than just look at the individual sentences, they look at how this whole discussion you know, evolves and what, what, how language is used throughout this discussion. Sometimes they'll look at the flow of ideas and how they how they flow in a particular discourse. You know, they try to identify the main ideas and how the cohesive elements uh, work and what are the markers, right? They try to understand the things that aren't being said, the inferences that are going on. Um, again, to learn more about how language is actually being used, not how act uh, language ought to be used. A subset of this is conversational analysis, and that's investigating the dynamics of a conversation. Uh, you know, how people can um, take turns, uh, how, can, how they can uh, suggest things, or they can change the topic. And, and it's interesting that in different cultures, it's done differently. Uh, as far as interrupting or sparking an idea or, um, you know, encouraging or discouraging someone during a conversation and how that's done. Um, living overseas, I was very interested to learn that, um, that uh, if you're in a group meeting, younger people probably do not speak up uh, because it's more proper to let the older uh, people uh, speak up. Uh, regardless of whether they're right or not, regardless of whether they know the content or not. Uh, there's a process, and so people, begin when they're studying um, conversational analysis, they're, they're looking at the actual conversation and how these things go about. It's rather interesting to learn how these things are different and how they function. Again, you can communicate better if you have that competence. Another way to analyze uh, discourse is something called corpus linguistics. Uh, years ago in England, uh, there were people that walked around all these different parts of England and tried to 
uh, write down the language because they they thought it was going to be disappearing. You know, things like Cockney and and some of the other uh, well, there are many other types of uh, of English all the way from from the south all the way up to uh, northern Scotland. Um, but they wrote all these things down. They wrote down all the words used, the phrases used, the accents. Um, and eventually these were put into like a huge dictionary that had a whole bunch of connected information to it. And now they're in, now they're in, uh, now they're in the computer. It's a computer analysis of a collection of texts to help identify certain features. Um, I have read articles where, uh, people take, uh, you know, a large swath of, uh, Shakespeare and then analyze all of the words that are used and where they come from. The history of all these words. All this can be done with uh, with a corpus linguistics. They can then tr analyze not only where what all these words are, but where do these words come from. Uh, for example, when uh, in Shakespeare, when he's dealing with a very emotional uh, segment of text, uh, the language that is used is more personal, is more is more uh, Germanic and more uh, Old English type of language. And when when uh, some in, in uh, Hamlet somebody's using uh, or discussing things that are more rational or more logical or more uh, separated from feelings, they tended to use words that were closer aligned with uh, languages like French or Greek uh, or Latin. Uh, it was again. It was quite interesting to note. You can do that type of analysis. There's also contrastive rhetoric, where you investigate the differences between written language of a variety of languages and the impact that they have on language learning. So you can compare multiple languages. You can compare uh, and contrast a language, uh, you know, English, but from uh, different uh, different parts uh, of the globe, and see how those differences are. You can also see again between different languages and see how one language impacts another. So, for example, I could probably think of a hundred words in Japanese that actually come directly from English or from other languages, but I probably couldn't find a dozen words in, uh, in English that come from Japanese. And so you can do that type of contrastive rhetoric. You can see where one Im impacts the other and how so. Uh, and that's contrastive rhetoric. Okay, and this is again just gaining more competence in the communication that's going on. The last element here uh, that we've got listed here is pragmatics, and that's conveying and interpreting the meanings of a language in a given context. In other words, understanding what's not being said or what is meant but not actually uttered. Um, there are times when things aren't said but they are said um so and you have to learn that and again this is again part of the competence of of uh, language i was uh, in japan for example i'm giving you an example i was in japan and watching uh listening to someone tell a story about this daughter who's asking his her father if she can do something and uh she asked several times and the father never answered he would not answer her. And, and later on, I find out that what that meant was he didn't want to say yes, um, but he couldn't say no. And because he couldn't say no, what he really was saying was, I'm giving you a, a soft yes. So whatever she wanted to do, she could actually do. Um, and, and that would be these things that aren't being said. Um, years ago, there was a king who who at one point was uh, lamenting over the fact that uh, uh, Thomas Beckett was being, uh, uh, who he, he, and he was, uh, I think he was a priest, and he was being in a certain, he was being uh, um, difficult, according to the king, and the king at one point made the suggestion, boy, I really wish he was dead, and he made it as a, I wish he was, not a command, but somebody understood that what he meant was, get rid of this guy, and he did. It'll be another example of something that's not being said. I'm certain that uh, we don't have to deal with things that are re related to uh, dying or disobeying, but there are times where things that uh, are are uh, intended to be said. It's an illocutionary act, but it's not spoken. Okay, it's uh, it's uh, under the radar type of thing. Uh, and that's what pragmatics is about. It's a very interesting area of study. There are other areas of communication uh, competence, for example, uh, language and gender, and the way language is used. Uh, 
the the way men use language and what versus the way women use language, how women speak to men and women speak to women, and a variety of different ways that you can see how language is used. Um, you can talk about the different types of register that there are as well, the different types of sexism or type of linguistic limitation. Uh, there are words that men can say that women can't say and vice versa. Um, there are, are um, critical words for men, but there are probably more critical words for women. Uh, and why that is, I don't know. It's probably a, some type of uh, some type of prejudice. But you see that there's a difference with language in that sense. Uh, and then there's the description of a typical use of language by gender, how how women use language and versus how men use language. So, like I say, there are, uh, in in the realm of pragmatics, all of this fits into communicative competence. If you understand more how women use language or how men use language, you're going to better be able to understand and convey ideas and meanings. Um, I, for example, when I lived overseas, most of my teachers were female, and in speak, when you speak in Japanese, there are certain words and phrases that only women use. But I had a very good ear, and I listened to what they were saying, even when they weren't talking to the class. You know, another teacher would come, and they would be talking, and I would hear what they would say and think, oh, I'm going to copy that. And I was copying female language patterns instead of male language patterns. Got myself in trouble. I didn't realize this information, right? My communicative competence with regard to gender wasn't there. People then eventually started telling me, you know, on the side there, yeah, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to talk that way. Uh, that's, uh, that's more of a lady's way of speaking. So having that competence is definitely a plus. Another type of communication that we all use is nonverbal communication. There's an excellent text out there called The, the Silent Language. Uh, and it talks about how we use nonverbal communication skills to communicate a whole bunch of things. And um, so this is an area that you might be interested in. Uh, one of the subcomponents here is kinesics. It's body language other than physical features of communication. And there are a whole bunch of these uh, elements that we use to communicate or not communicate, right? Uh, one, for example, is eye contact. There are some cultures they try to shy away. They don't want to look when you're when they're talking to you. Other cultures they'll look directly at you. And then, of course, there's the question of how long are you allowed to look before it's intrusion? Um, you know, and every culture is different, you know, they can look for a long time or a short time and all the meanings that go along there. We have the whole concept of proxemics or how close can you get to somebody before you enter their private space. Some cultures, they have more, their space is larger, right? Other people, other cultures, their space is, is much closer so they can get closer to you and talk and you feel comfortable. <laughs> um, it's interesting when you meet two different groups where one is closer uh, than the other. Again, I had an example where I was uh, over visiting some friends in Germany, and uh, I sat down on the sofa, and I sat right next to this young lady that I didn't know, and I meant nothing by it. But because I sat down next to her, she felt very uh, uncomfortable and got up and sat, you know, went over and sat somewhere else. And I noticed at that point that I had done something wrong. I didn't realize before then, because in my culture, sitting next to somebody didn't mean as much. Um, this whole idea of proxemics. Some people uh, want more distance, others don't. Um, artifacts, things like clothes or jewelry or um, makeup or perfume. Uh, some cultures are very much concerned with how they look, how they appear in public, how they smell or don't smell. There are certain cultures where they hate perfume. They want natural smell. There are other cultures that hate natural smell. So um, the artifacts that you put on. Kinesthetics, touching, touching. I am uh, have an Italian background, and so there's a lot of touching uh, in my family, which is no big deal. But you go to other cultures, again, like uh, uh, probably British culture or German culture or uh, definitely some of the Asian cultures where there is no, you know, in Japan, for example, you, when you meet someone, you bow. You, you, don't, you don't give them a hug. You don't shake their hand. You don't kiss them on the cheek. None of that. Um, and so that's an issue. It's the whole idea of touching. Uh, we have olfactics, and that's smell, and whether you are um, um, insulting somebody because you smell too nice or you don't smell nice enough or, or uh, something like that. Uh, again, being on the train in Japan, there are people who, when they're sick, they, they put on or they take some kind of medicine, and it smells atrocious. 
But nobody says anything. Nobody complains because that's just the way it is. And so nobody would talk about that. Um, so that's all, all factics. Um, time would be another nonverbal type of thing. There are some cultures that are very, very much concerned about being on time. Uh, the trains in Tokyo, one, there's one train line, for example. There's a train that arrives every two minutes uh, during certain times of the day. They cannot be late. They must be on time because there's another train coming. And uh, so time is so very important for a culture like that. The trains in Mexico do not travel nearly as on time because in their culture, time is more relaxed. Um, I knew, I knew a guy who, uh, you know, going to a party, the party starts at eight. He had no problem showing up at nine 30. Um, other cultures aren't going to be that way. I think it's interesting in the United States. Um, if you have an appointment or a job interview, you arrive several minutes early, two, three minutes early at least. But for a party, you never arrive on time. You have to arrive a couple minutes late. Um, so if the party starts at 8, you maybe show up at 8.15, something like that. Um, again, other cultures, you show up at 8.30, you show up at 9 o'clock, no big deal. <laughs> Time is different. Uh, lastly would be organization, how you organize and order things. Um, so, for example, if we're buying a tea set, in all likelihood, all the cups will be the same shape and color. In other cultures, they wouldn't necessarily be all the same shape and color. In fact, having them different would be, quote-unquote, organized. Uh, the elements that you would put into a lunch, a lunch bucket for to eat lunch or the stuff that you would put into a picnic basket uh, to go out and eat outside are going to be different depending on the, again, depending on the culture that you're in. Um, so the way we organize things things are going to be different. The way you organize your home, the way you organize your suitcase or your sock drawer are all going to depend uh, in part on um, on the culture that you're coming from. And so nonverbal communication is one other component of this communicative competence. Um, the more of these that we know, obviously, the better we're going to be able to understand what's going on and better to be able to understand uh, the communication. Well, we also have gestures that I didn't talk about, you know. Uh, you know, like, what does this mean, or what does this mean, or this mean? Uh, and they all have different meanings, and some of them have different meanings in different cultures. So um, that's another element here we can put into nonverbal. Uh, based on the research that uh, people have done related to communicative competence, uh, recent um, modes of teaching, recent, recent approaches to teaching have emerged, one being the communicative language teaching uh, approach. And uh, communicative language teaching is uh, probably a, uh, an off, uh, a merging of uh, your more traditional grammar translation methods with some of the newer Krashonian slash communicative competency um, ideas. Uh, they focus on all aspects of communicative competence, and it's not restricted to just linguistics. Again, in the past, it would be restricted to learning the grammar and the vocabulary, right? So, but it's more than that. They encourage learners to be involved in the pragmatic and authentic, functional and meaningful language use. So they're trying to hone in on real language, pragmatic language, things that aren't being said, uh, functional language, and of course the the uh, the linguistic as well. There is equal emphasis on fluency and accuracy, and uh, so for some students they want to be absolutely accurate before they're fluent, and others are vice versa. This model of teaching tries to stress both fluency and accuracy, and that means that you've got to get them to do a lot, but you also don't want them to fossilize. The other difference here in this mode is that students are using language in the class and they're using it a lot because they need a lot of input. Of course, they need a lot of output, but it needs to be uh, them practicing. So there's going to be a larger emphasis on student-based um, communication. The other uh, mode, the other method or approach is task-based language teaching. And this, in task-based language teaching, um, the focus is not on learning language. The focus is on accomplishing a task. Now, obviously, in order to accomplish that task, 
you've got to learn language. But the focus of it isn't on, hey, we're going to sit down here and we're just going to study grammar and vocabulary. It's here we need to, we need to, you know, prepare for a party or we need to get on the bus and go to some, you know, and, and what do I need in order to accomplish that task? What vocab and grammar do I need to accomplish that task? Uh, and that's what this whole idea is behind task-based language teaching. When you do task-based language teaching, you're going to get more people interested because they're probably more interested in the task. Not as many people are interested in linguistics. You know, you don't have a lot of people saying, yay, let's study grammar. You know, they're not out there. But let's, uh, let's prepare for a party or let's learn how to make a pizza or, you know, let's learn how to write a paper if I have to write a paper. Uh, and they're more interested in that. Let's listen to the, let's be able to watch a movie or, you know, that type of thing. The task should be authentic. Okay. It should be uh, that they're focusing on the task, not the language, right? Now, you do need to prepare. You need to provide the, you know, the skills and, and materials they need in order to do the task. Um, so you need to do some prep work. You need to and develop their schema, right? Um, so that uh, they can complete the task. But you need to remember, the task is the primary objective, not the language. It requires students to communicate with each other and negotiate meaning. So they're going to have to struggle to try to understand what's going on. But remember, their task is what's paramount, is what's primary. And that's all for this, uh, this week. Uh, if you do have any questions within the chapter, you can put those online, and uh, I'm hoping to have a live session as well in case you guys want to talk and communicate, and also uh, make sure that you get your homework done. I've done a lot of correcting. If there is any work that you have that's late that you want to try to get in, please go do it and let me know because I would be glad to revise your grades. Have a nice day.